the strange and wonderful automobile, an invention that immediately captured our imagination and continues to change our world. Early on, Hollywood cast the automobile as a comedic device, but that role never kept the general public from embracing the automobile. If we are indeed known by the company we keep, and our car is constant company, we reason that what we drive is part of who we are. Contrary to the Hollywood mogul stereotyping, advertising recognized this emotional involvement at the outset. And today's sales strategy is built on the same platform, presenting the car as an extension of one's personality, an alter ego, a romantic notion molded in glass and steel. But for once, reality may actually outstrip Madison Avenue. In the fascinating field of classic cars, we see a level of pure joy and devotion difficult to explain. Below, concealed within this trailer, one such car has been rescued from the ravages of time and is being motored towards its new destiny, restoration. But just how are people drawn into the romance of restoration? What kind of vision enables the car lover to look through the years of grime to see the restoration possibility underneath? Why do members of America's several thousand antique and classic car clubs lavish attention on Grands, Cords, Duesenbergs, and dozens of other makes and models which the world has otherwise left behind? A visit to White Post Restorations in White Post, Virginia, widely regarded as one of the top restoration shops in the world, provide some insights into the classic car phenomenon. Consider the story of Mr. Charles Benn. In uh, about 85, 1985, I decided that I would start looking around for a 59 to so. Mr. Benn remembers why 1959 means so much. I happened to be going with a certain young lady at the time, and she kind of liked this car. Also, of course, I kid her in telling her that the only reason she married me was because of the day going automobile. It wasn't me, you know. Now this car has come to White Post for restoration, with the hopes of bringing a piece of fondly remembered past into the present, and in turn, rekindling a romance. One man, one car. And while the cast of characters changes, Many enthusiasts will tell a tale of memories made in one special car. Yet there are many for whom the attraction goes far beyond any single make or model. Inspired by a natural affinity for machinery, the love of work well done and an appreciation of history are the classic car connoisseurs. I personally enjoy working on the brass era cars, which are mainly pre-World War I. I appreciate the explosion of technology that was taking place at the time. Another thing I enjoy about this period of history is sort of like chasing ghosts. I enjoy meeting the people who built these cars. A unique thing about this Duryea is the fact that Mr. Duryea, in designing this car, apparently had to do it differently than the other auto makers of the period. He apparently was a contrary person. <laughs> Documentation on many of the early cars is not hard to come by. The Hupmobile can be documented very well because of the sheer numbers of cars they turned out. It was a production car. They turned out a lot of them. A lot of them still exist. It's not hard to compare cars. Some details you can pick out right away. Types of bolts. They, the uh, SAE changed bolt specs at a certain point in history. And you know that if it has a low head, doesn't have a nice crown on it, then it's a modern bolt. If it's got markings on it, grade markings. It's a modern bolt. Uh, among the metals that they did use, they used a lot of brass, especially for 
parts that had to be stamped or spun, although they used aluminum, they used cast iron, they had some pretty good grades of steel, although people look back and say they didn't have the metallurgy, but they sure did. Steel, leather, wood, glass, fabric, and paint. If ever there were a shining example of the phrase more than the sum of its parts, it is this 1926 Rolls-Royce, restored to showroom condition. As if by magic, all of the separate elements have been reassembled into the vanguard of grace, style, and power. Those who contribute their abilities to such pursuits will tell you that the magic is in the method. The 1926 Rolls-Royce was recently completed took somewhere over 5,000 hours. Uh, people don't realize in a restoration of this type that there are many, many parts involved that have to be taken apart and cleaned and polished and painted or whatever has to be done. Some of the interesting details on a, a, a car like this are Barker dipper lights where the headlights actually move up and down, leather-covered gaiters that's an often overlooked detail. This particular Rolls has a body by Barker Barker was a coach builder, and when you bought a Rolls, you just bought the chassis. And you went to whatever coach builder you wanted to, most of them previous carriage builders, to have the body built. People with an itch for restoration work of this quality soon learn that it is not a hurry-up enterprise, and that there is no easy formula for estimating the cost. Frame up restoration. The process begins by photographing the unrestored car. The body is removed from the frame and the car is dismantled down to individual screws before the work of repair, replacement, and reconstruction begin. Here, Paul Rose directs the reassembly of a 1961 Mercedes 300 SL. It is impractical to give an estimate on restoring a frame up restoration until you take the car apart and firsthand know what's going on inside. You have no idea what's underneath the carpet, the paint. You could strip the paint off the car and find that someone else has been there 10 years before you with coat hangers, cardboard, wire screen, and God knows what else in the car. The 300SL that I'm presently restoring was repaired once at the factory, and like any other body shop, they were there to make money and get the car in and get the car out and repairs just weren't up to our standards here, so we had to make everything right again. So it makes the job very difficult when you strip a car down and find the damage from years gone by uh, underneath the cosmetic repair of someone else. Metalworking, reconstructing the frame and body of the automobile combines tools and techniques from earlier times with current technology. And the metal worker must be proficient with them all, from the antique Pettengill hammer to the modern plasma cutter. The challenge to me as, as a metal man is to take what is given me, what's in front of me, that was done years and years ago, and to drop myself back into that era and then take it from there through the restoration process. A good example is the the body seams, how the seams were formed in, in pieces and then seamed together and welded together to form the finished product, say a fender or even bumpers. It's intriguing to see how different craftsmen would approach the same job. Like the left side will be externally the same as the right side, except if you look at the back side, they'll, they'll be done by different craftsmen and they'll be pieced together differently. And it's very interesting to see that, and that's the fun part for me, is to, to go back in time and visualize or try to visualize what they've done and how they went about doing it, and to duplicate that. And that's, the, that's a challenge. Older automobiles often included wooden frame and body components. That which time and the elements work in concert to destroy the woodworker must recreate. Consider the challenge confronting woodworker Donnie Carver, reconstructing one car at a time. No two cars of the same make within months of one another means that each piece is unique, 
a production run of one requiring its own jigs and machine settings. And even in a well-equipped shop, technology will never match the craftsman's feel for the wood, his sense of how to work each piece into exactly the right form. As the pieces take shape and are assembled, the skill of the woodworker becomes transparent. We see only the seamless beauty of the finished car. Where technology has developed superior materials, authenticity is balanced with common sense. Preparing to paint, painting, and finishing demands this carefully considered approach. Of course, you start with bare metal, and then you put one or two coats of epoxy primer on the bare metal. Successive layers are applied until you uh, arrive at a smooth surface, sanding and priming and sanding in between coats and that's how the imperfections are uh, eliminated. The leading process, I guess, goes back to the beginning of automobile manufacture or before. Uh, it's, it's a process by which uh, molten lead or semi-molten lead is applied to uh, the, the seam and smoothed out with a, uh, called a solder paddle. And of course, as it cools, it uh, hardens and then it's filed down to the, match the original contours of the, the part that you're working on. One of the reasons uh, that uh, a restoration paint job looks so much better is because of the undercoats, sanded between coats and uh, block sanded. That's why the final finish looks so smooth. For comfort and beauty, supple leather and rich wool, the classic materials of trim and upholstery remain unsurpassed. Mastery over these materials combined with ingenuity and skilled hands are vital to a successful restoration. The right approach, the right materials, and the right skills. Essential for show quality restorations. Are they sufficient to guarantee that every part of every car is sound and authentic? Human performance and motivation are critical factors here. To produce top quality work without exception, the working environment is the key. To do this level of restoration, first of all, a mechanic has to care about his work. And second, he has to be given the time and place to do the work. I consider myself lucky to be in an environment where I can do my very best. It's very important in the restoration business today and restoring antique and classic cars to surround yourself with people that really care about what they do. I provide a facility and equipment for our people to restore these cars and it's very important that they're allowed to have the time to do good quality work. After working with a car closely and been involved with a car and you're a mechanic and you've maybe you've spent a year or two restoring a big classic car and, and the car gets near finished and it's time to go home and and uh, you get a little sad when you see a car go home after you've worked with it a year or two but you can always look forward and, and find uh, that there's another one coming in right behind that one Paul Rose applies finishing touches to the restored DeSoto. When a customer brings a car in, you get the feeling that he wants his car as soon as possible. But as the customer sees the car undergoing the frame-up restoration, you get the feeling that he's enthused about it to the point where he wants to for it to last as long as possible. And then when it's all over and the car is all reassembled, test driven and given back to the customer, it's kind of sad because you, you work for a man or a woman for a year, you get to know them pretty well. And then they're going out of the parking lot, you've moved on to another project and started all over again. And it feels kind of weird just going from one car to a totally different kind of car. At the end, I kind of imagine that it's sad for the owner, too, because I think it's been fun for them along the way. As with all truly sustaining interests, classic car restoration and ownership can be appreciated on a number of levels. 
For most, whatever may have sparked their initial interest, the richest rewards come from the opportunity to share that interest with others. The National DeSoto Club Show. Cars will be scrutinized for authenticity and will reflect the personalities of their owners, trigger memories, and provide a background for relaxed companionship. These enthusiasts will see one another again, and again they will enjoy one another's company, telling and retelling stories over the hood of their favorite car. With the passing of time, the age parameters delineating what constitutes a restorable classic car move forward. And so, continually, collectors comb the countryside, peering into old barns and carriage houses for lost and forgotten treasure. The rare find takes on the character of the prodigal son's return. A deal is struck, and the sleeping beauty is trailered and transported toward rebirth. The cars of yesteryear have been displaced from their original roles. Whether they were state-of-the-art, the fastest, practical family transportation, or the latest mechanical novelty. Yet restoration gives them new life with new purpose. Through great and careful effort, a piece of history, both technological and personal, is preserved. And we are rewarded with a glimpse of days presumed to be gone forever. Their restored status is not altogether different from our hopes for ourselves as we grow older. To be appreciated and cared for in graceful retirement. 